you guys like what you see today, you like hearing these stories from these wonderful seniors, what we're starting are bi-weekly events called Tuesday Toast. It'll be every other Tuesday in the living room of the Women's Center and from 5 to 6 p.m. and we're going to like toast to all of you guys because everyone on this campus, they're doing amazing things. Like everyone around you, you're like, oh, she's doing this, he's doing that, awesome things. And so we want to bring you all in, give you a little toast, have you talk about it, and then at the same time, everyone else gets to learn about a new opportunity, a new organization, a new form of activism. So we're all learning and building Swanee stronger together. So the kickoff for this is October 1st in the living room from 5 to 6 p.m. It's going to be Sable Rogers, who if you all don't know, she lives in the Coho, and she's heading up an amazing project where every themed house on campus is helping bringing Tennessee native flowers back to campus. So please come on out then and raise a glass with us. All right, so Michelle kind of mentioned the idea of building Swanee stronger. And outside of these specific events that we're planning, that's kind of the theme that we're running this with this year is building Swanee stronger. And so without further ado or blabbing from Michelle and I, the Pinnacle Collections. spending over three days in the South, and obviously that does not include Florida. <laughs> first time drinking sweet tea and eating shrimp and grits, and first time being called a Yankee. I love my first, my list of firsts. Without it, I would have never joined the swim team, I would have never gone abroad, I would have absolutely never minored in French, volunteered at the CAC, or be my sorority's president. I'll put a lot of money down that most of us have created long lists of firsts since we've arrived at Swanee, even if you haven't lived in the South before you got here. Our individual lists might be complicated and different, but, all they got, but they all got and continue to get us excited about becoming a part of the community that we, have now called, that we now call home. As I jumped into my car to drive from Swanee to New York, yet another first, I realized that my list of firsts was quickly turning into a long list of lasts. My last real summer vacation, last first day of school, last summer swims in the res, last advent semester. This list gets longer and longer each passing day of my senior year. I can't stop time, yeah I guess that's obvious, but I also don't get any do-overs. So how do I make it count? Well, Shouldn't I do what every other typical senior girl and boy does? Live it up. YOLO! Translation, you only live once. <laughs> this sounds familiar? Seniors are very egotistical. I know this because I am one and I have had many of the common side effects. For example, one of the most common is the seriously again feeling. For example, or, sorry, this often is a sentiment when over 20 C student emails are sent to the entire student body by the time we hit McClure for lunch, or here for lunch. We seniors are already involved in clubs, so most likely do not need to attend the activities fair. It's easy and understandable for us to feel this way. We live in a bubble of a community and that we are, na that we are now accustomed to and comfortable in. We all know that dinner time means 5.30, and if you want bacon, you better get to McClure before 9.30. We are pros, we are leaders. I remember the last few weeks of my time spent abroad in Freiburg, Germany. All my friends had created their lists of everything they wanted to do before they left. Which clubs have we yet, had yet to go to? Which food, German food have we yet to try? But why try all these new things? I had already been here for four months. If I hadn't gone to a club in this tiny town by now, shouldn't that be a sign? <laughs> shouldn't we spend our last nights in Freiburg doing what we have, all, we have done all semester? Why would we change our typical Tuesday plan in the last week that we were here? I had accumulated my long list of lasts, and boy, was I going to enjoy every last part of them. Now, seniors, 
I'm not saying you shouldn't hike the perimeter trail because you haven't yet and that you're thinking this might be a sign. <laughs> but why should we change our whole schedule and Swanee lifestyle just because our time here is dwindling and we have this new senior persona tagged onto our names? If you didn't used to go out on Tuesday nights, you don't all of a sudden need to go out on Tuesday nights. <laughs> Most of my friends were far from intimidating to underclassmen last year. So why after a short summer do many of them feel like they need to be? We didn't get away with drinking in glass bottles last year. What makes us think that we're exempt from the rules this year? We seniors are constantly being looked up to by underclassmen and looked up upon by <coughs> professors, police officers, and staff to set the example. Like I said, we are the pros. We are the leaders. We determine much more than what the appropriate time to dine in McClure is. But in truth, when we were but in truth, we were awesome even before we became, we became seniors. My classmates are the most beautiful, the most respected, and the most honorable women and men I know. And I know I'll be friends with most of them forever. So let's make a pact to keep with the EQB Swanee spirit as we begin our senior year on the mountain together. Let's do what we do best. No need to change ourselves just because we are now called seniors. If anything, make that a new label Make that new label a chance to do and be better. If it, this, that hasn't been on your list of, list of first yet, that be and do better, by goodness, you better get it on quick. Because time is dwindling. Get the grades you always wanted. Get to know the names of the women who sit in the front door of McClurg. Hike the perimeter trail. Leave a positive legacy for your sorority or your fraternity chapter, your team, your ensemble, your seminar group, with, with your independent study. Let's leave this place better than we found it, shall we? And finish up strong. Toast to the seniors. summer after my freshman year and one of the greatest things I figured out while at summer camp is that some of the best teachers in the world are children. If you spend time with a child, it's easy to notice their incredible fascination with the world, curious natures and absolutely playful attitudes. But as we get older, we lose our childhood attitudes and tendencies. My childhood was awesome, but when you're a child, all you want to be is older, right? For example, you know when you're 11 and you're in that dreaded tween age? You really, you're going to be 13. And when you're 15, you want to be 17 so that you can get into that rated R movie without like, actually sneaking in. After that point, though, you want to be 21. <laughs> now that I'm at the pinnacle of age, the fake 21, I've encountered a dilemma that I was absolutely not prepared for. Old age. <laughs> I feel somewhat old, before I kept getting rewarded as I got older. So what's the point of being young? Now that I'm 21, all I have to look forward to is being able to rent a car when I'm 25. <laughs> Who honestly cares about that, right? <laughs> the joy of becoming older does not last forever. And it's something that as I'm leaving this place, in some ways all I want to do is turn back time. It's a point that is becoming more and more relevant to my life as I look beyond the gates and off the limits of what my life can be. I was talking to my housemate, Charlie Hughes, and something he said to me that truly made an impact on me was, Vikash, I found out something really great about life. Now, if you all know Charlie Hughes, that could be anything. <laughs> I mean, that can be a new candy that he tried in a vending machine to something 
so profound. <laughs> Thank you for you all. It wasn't a candy or anything like that. It was a profound statement. <laughs> Something I've been toying around with is that I'm not just 21. I'm a combination of ages. I'm 21, but I'm also 15, 5, and I'm also 9. Time doesn't work like how we think. I'm all these ages all at once. It started to get me thinking about my dilemma. So, Operation Go Back in Time was in progress. Too bad I don't have a ball and time machine like Marty McFly, but <laughs> let's be honest, it's not stopping me. I'm going to just be a kid again. But just like anything in the world, there are always cons. And one of the cons about being a child is being childish. The best way to explain the difference between the two is that being childlike entails letting your imagination drive you. Find joy in the simple things. Do things just because you love to do them. Be 100% in everything you do. Hang out and best of all, just play. Being childish is the exact opposite and is personified in that one bratty child that you've had to tutor or babysat. Just downright mean. But now that we have matured past that point, it will make being a kid so much better. And that's what I urge everyone in this room to do. Be childlike again. Be five, seven, however old you want to be because you've been there and you can be that person again. So going along with the theme of building strong and stronger, everyone should strive to be childlike and not childish. So how about we meet these people again? <laughs> Of an inch that I'm standing here talking to you all today. 
That was once the distance between a bullet and my back. Four years ago, a little before 6 a.m., my estranged mother snuck into the house where I lived with my dad at the time. She had been struggling with severe mental illness and it tore our small family apart. I woke up to my dad screaming and the sound of three gunshots. When I looked up, my bedroom door opened and I saw my own mother's face with a gun held in both of her hands pointed at me. I turned to my side, closed my eyes, and listened as another shot sounded off. By one inch, she missed me, and I was able to lock the door and call 911. I survived, but my dad died in the hospital several hours later. Okay. Everyone take a deep <laughs> breath. <laughs> I know that, that was so difficult to hear, and it was really difficult for me to share, so thank you so much for listening. And there is certainly more to this story, but that's not really the point. The point is that I just did what few of us get to do in day-to-day -day interactions here at Swanee. I just got real with you, and I told you something incredibly personal. There are few spaces on campus where I have felt truly comfortable sharing what has happened. And there have been times and situations where I have shared my story and felt utterly embarrassed and ashamed afterwards. And that has been really painful. But between my close friends, beloved professors and mentors, and the Women's Center, I have found my support system. The Women's Center in particular has been a place for me to reclaim my story. By participating in its program over the years, I have come to realize that I have nothing to be ashamed about. I am worthy of great things. I matter and I deserve respect. I am an empowered and empowering woman. This story does not define me and I am not my mother. I realized something else too and this is very important. My story is not so uncommon at all. Look around this room, because I would venture to say that most people here and everywhere else have a story of tragic loss, unrelenting family conflict, personal struggle, and yes, even unspeakable acts of violence. I can assure you that it is more common than you would think. And so I close with this. First. As a community, we need to be more mindful that everyone has their own story. I truly believe that encountering affliction in life is universal, and no matter what the trouble may be, it is sometimes difficult to endure. Let's make life a little easier on each other. You never know what someone is going through. Would you have known that about me if I had not told you? There are so many things we can do every day to offer support without knowing every person's story. We can smile at someone when we pass them on campus. When we ask how someone's day is, we can ask like we really mean it. We can watch out for each other on the weekends and treat each other with respect. We can refrain from petty gossip. We can acknowledge each other as equals. We can have each other's back and we can be good to each other. We can also do more than that. We can reach out when someone is struggling instead of looking away. When we are hurtful towards others, we can make the situation right instead of ignoring it. We can make the time to talk to each other more. Often sharing difficult stories allows the space for more honest and for more meaningful communication. We all could learn something valuable from that kind of exchange. Conversation is reciprocal, we just need to start it. We can reaffirm each other, hold each other up, and build each other stronger. Second, I want to say something to anyone in this room who is currently burdened by a struggle or a pain that they hold deep in their hearts. I want to tell you that it gets better. It gets so much better. Since being at Swanee, I have been processing and healing probably the most magnificent loss I will ever face in my life. My dad was my best friend and my champion, and I meant everything to him. Every year that has passed, I have felt more distant from his memory. 
And in my first few years at Swanee, I had this void in my heart and I didn't know how to fill it. So I focused on the loss and I let it define me and everything I did. But I have grown so much from that through the conversations I have had on this campus and the support I have gotten along the way. I'm the daughter of a dad who was murdered and a mother who was in prison for the rest of her life. But I'm also the co-director of the Women's Center and I'm rocking it. <laughs> months abroad, traveled all over Europe, won an internship in the European Parliament, and was the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. I came home to a family that has taken me in as their own daughter and loves me unconditionally. I climbed mountains in Colorado with John Benson, and I went to Jamaica with Dixon. I'm writing an honors thesis. I have really great friends, and I'm at peace with my life right now. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but I'm stronger. So thank you to everyone who has helped me to build myself stronger over the past four years. I hope I have done the same for you, and I hope that everyone at Swanee can do that for each other. And if you are currently looking for a space of support on this campus, please look at the back table before you leave. There's a resident chaplain, Katie Bradshaw, who's gonna start facilitating bi-weekly meetings to start a community of support for those who have experienced any kind of loss on campus. Katie, could you please stand up? Thank you. And so sit around afterwards for questions, and you can also email me if you want to be in contact with her. Thank you. so much for coming today. Not this past weekend, but the weekend before, I ran in a cross-country race over at the Swanee Golf Course. I tried to hold myself back on the first of the three laps, as it's a common mistake to start off too fast. I needed to save myself for the next two. However, as I began to climb the hills early in the second lap, Setting my jaw and locking my eyes on the shoes of the runners in front of me, I developed some terrible side stitches and the like. Devastated that this might turn out to be a bad race, I began to think. Anytime I don't run well, I consider all the possible causes. I hadn't gotten enough sleep the past couple of days. I hadn't eaten well enough. I had too much soda at McClurg, which is a big running no-no. Worse yet, I hadn't run as much or as hard as I should have this past summer feeling as though I had failed to a small degree. Somewhere in this second lap, I turned my attention to my surroundings and latched on to the most familiar things, my teammates. They inevitably had also failed in ways similar to the ways I had failed, maybe only in one regard each or something like that. But nevertheless, we had skipped in our training in similar ways. But I could see some of my teammates, and they were doing wonderfully. They were trying so hard, and I marveled at their strength as I tried to keep up with them. As for the people ahead of me and behind me that I could not see, I mentally urged them on and was amazed by their struggle and sacrifice and will. We entered the final loop. That final loop around the golf course is like this year, my last at Swanee. My Swanee experience, my race, has been flawed. Though I try each day, I am constantly failing in little ways, in large ones. I am so much less than good. In my interactions with others, most times I do succeed at trying to convey to people that I care about them. But failures speak volumes. At McClurg with, deal, with dear friends, while we wait in Fowler for cross-country practice to start, while I'm leading Gay Straight Alliance meetings, <coughs> passing people walking to class, and in the dorm at night at Emory, this year's first gender and sexual diversity house, my interactions are sometimes curt and unauthentic. They are awkward and feel false. Why can't we humans connect better, show each other we care? There are so many times I have done wrong, and there are so many people I have left in the dust. I fail in the classroom too, 
when my patience is tested, when I don't feel smart, hardworking, or believed in, I sometimes respond with sarcasm, anger, and indifference. I am so much less than brave. My struggle on campus, my struggle on campus <coughs> as a lesbian has been an interesting one. While I've never been prejudiced against or bullied, at least not directly or as far as I know, I do live with a constant sense of insecurity. I feel as though I am being judged, or as though I am constantly bracing myself for a blow. But that strike has never come. It hasn't, and I owe Swanee more credit than I give it. You all have my back, and I don't give you the trust you deserve. Perhaps because I've never had a long romantic relationship, I fear people see me as a fake. When it's time for the GSA to hold an event, I reach back to grasp the support of those behind me, fearing that I will find no one. Instead, I should be reaching to my side with trust. <clears throat> when someone next to me slurs faggot, not about me, just in general, I meekly protest. So quietly, the utterer does not have to respond. Blood boils silently. I wish I could be more brave. If I could tell Swanee one thing, that I have learned before leaving this place, it would be this. Even when you fail, you must keep trying. I'm not talking about those epic failures that come a handful of times each semester. I'm talking about everyday little failures. Because y'all in this room and outside, my teammates, my fellow runners, unfortunately, everything I fail at is human nature, and so inevitably you fail at things similar as well. When you meet someone and say, hi, how are you? Really try to listen, be they staff or community member, student or faculty. Wait for an answer, expect one. I will try to. If you hear a racist, classist, thinnest, transphobic, homophobic, or sexist remark, say something, even if it's just something small. If you are good at humor, use humor to, use humor to help. I will try to. Try to find ways to make Swanee the best it can be. I'm talking about small ways, ways that don't even take too much of your time. Go to the meeting of a club that is for a group you don't even belong to, um, just to show your support and because you want to understand. I need to do this more often myself. Volunteer. Go on Swanee's Posse Plus Retreat, which is always held soon after we get back from winter break, to spend a weekend at, essentially, a camp with other Swanee students discussing issues of grave importance to diversity, which is our strength. Y'all, we owe it to each other. We really do, because to quote two great people at once, we belong to each other, and everyone is fighting such a great battle. When you try to do these things, inevitably you will fail sometimes, and you must not give up. Honestly, Swanee, in many ways, I'm asking you to keep doing the things that you are already doing, because every day, Swanee students amaze me. You all inspire me. You create and hold campus events with meaning. You study hard to make your lives what you want them to be. You sacrifice your time for friends, and for those who are not your friends, just your Swanee family, and manage every day to fill the campus with a joy that I can often feel. When you fail, you try again, and I'm asking you to keep on doing that. Don't give up on being a friend. Don't let injustice pass you by, for we are all equals. Let's work on these things together, because goodness knows I need the practice as well. Let's build Swanee stronger. On that last lap around the golf course at that Saturday morning cross-country race, I get my game back. My sides to just subside due to, either, due to either literal adrenaline or that which is caused by the strength of those around me. I can now close the distance between myself and the finish line more quickly and efficiently. Every step is a choice. Earlier than normal, I go into an end of race speed burst. It's risky, but there are always more races if I burn out and fail. I can always try again, but that does not make this race, the one in hand, any less meaningful or important. This race is mine and it is ours.
Good afternoon, school. My name is Will Winter. And over the past four years, I've been conducting an informal ethnographic study with my esteemed colleague, Nicole Sinclair. We've been researching the universal truths that drive Swanee social interactions. And through my intensive study of various subjects, this is what we have developed. A second tier popular theorem. <laughs> a theorem can be understood as the underlying explanation for all human social organization, and is the byproduct of billions of years of evolution. For years, we thought there were only two categories of human beings that developed during early adolescence, popular and not. <laughs> However, through our research, my colleagues and I have discovered a new and largely unexplored category of basic human organization known to some as the second tier. <laughs> to begin, let's start at the premier level of popularity. First <laughs> Hysteria. 
If anyone heard me crying, I was going to tell them I was watching a sad movie, like The Brave Little Toaster. Because I'd rather be known as someone who cried over lost talking kitchen appliances than actually come to terms with myself. I didn't want to be who I was, and I couldn't stand who I was trying to be. I was caught somewhere in between without my identity. Then, the morning after I had slipped out of character during my first real night out, I walked to the picnic table at Trez, and someone turned to me and said, you are quite feminine when you drink. <laughs> and it's awesome. <laughs> someone else chimed in saying, yeah, why aren't you like that all of the time? That was the moment I realized I wasn't in high school anymore. I wasn't in the second tier. And I arrived at a place that was very, very different. I was now in Swanee, and Swanee is a place where parks are celebrated. What I previously thought was a fault was now strength. And I was somewhere where people were open to celebrate what once have might made them insecure. In time, after embracing my reformed second tier identity, I was able to do something that, to my knowledge, no man at this university has ever done before. <laughs> Extremely nervous. 
You're either able to tell that I'm nervous, or you're unable to tell. <laughs> you also may not know whether or not I'm being serious. <laughs> just know that I'm just trying to be as transparent with you all as possible. <clears throat> I really like being in front of people. I really enjoy this attention and this spotlight. I will give you cues when you are supposed to laugh. My heartbeat is approximately 30 beats per minute higher than it is during the normal day. I am perspiring and my cheeks are red. Before dressing for this event, I was unclear as to how I should dress for this event. <laughs> my, my goal was to make you all laugh without destroying the fragile formality of a large-scale catered event such as this, <laughs> as, well, as well as tell, to tell you a little bit about my story. <clears throat> so, this room, can you turn it up a little? Um, <laughs> this room right now is a pretty perfect allegory for my life because I can feel the individual weight of each set of eyes that are here. Um, as Kurt Vonnegut said in the introduction to his biography, autobiography, Slapstick, this book is about the way that life feels to me. It's not about his life and like his trials and tribulations or anything like that or the facts, the chronological facts, but it was about the way that life felt to him. And this room right now is very much an allegory for the way that life feels to me at Suwannee, which is to say that I'm extremely nervous at all times. <laughs> that joke didn't go over as well as I wanted to say. <laughs> But back to serious topics. Suwannee is a hyper-social community. And growing up here as a son of Anna Dixon, I've oftentimes felt that there was pressure um, not to fail in a, in a public environment, in, a, in like a public capacity. Um, and that all eyes were, were on me at all times. And even more, that, that anything that I succeeded in doing was not necessarily because of any merit of my own, but more of just from some unfair advantage that I had. Because for my brother and I, college is not necessarily an opportunity for us to redefine ourselves and, and to flower into the beautiful beings that everyone thought we could be. We weren't really ever given a blank slate. And so I feel like for me, more than anything, um, my time here at Suwannee, specifically in these four years, but really across my life, has just been a test of my ability to remain dynamic in what feels oftentimes to me like a motionless and very static place. Can you imagine inside the head of an alumni? Okay, let's all put our heads in the side, in, inside of an alumni. Can you imagine what it is that they want to see when they come back here to Suwannee? How is it that we continue to market ourselves to these people from the past? And how do we continue to raise the money that supports this institution? How do we, how do we keep these, these people, these important benefactors around? We do this by remaining aesthetically and structurally frozen in history and frozen in time. They hope upon return with all of their hearts that they come back to see the Suwannee exactly the way that they left it, so, so ever, whatever, many years ago. They want to be able to touch and feel their memories again. In this way, Suwannee is really a place that is subjected to the power of the past. And we often dwell there as an institution. So throughout my life, I've employed all of these various tactics to escape what I feel like is this very frozen and stiff and to avoid, I guess, relationship, direct interaction with this stiff and frozen Suwannee. I've, I've hidden from it entirely. 
like this, hoping, hoping that what I peered back out, maybe it would have thawed out some, maybe, maybe it would have heated up a little bit, maybe. I've also just covered my eyes from it entirely. I've gotten drunk. I've even just left for months at a time, all to just escape or kind of, kind of slough off this frozen and ancient and traditional Swanee. It's because sometimes the pressure of all these individual sets of eyes has been a little too much. And sometimes the dead weight of all this ancient, traditional, sandstone, Swanee has just been too heavy for me. But this is not the high school, this is not the Swanee that I applied to go to in high school. It's not the Swanee that any of you all went to last year. For those of you who work here, this is not the Swanee who offered you a job. This is not the Swanee where your kids grew up. This isn't the Swanee where I grew up. To me, strength here is looking the static, frozen Swanee right in its eyes and refusing to be that way. The charge is to participate in the evolution of this place by evolving yourself. But you have to look it right in its eyes. You have to avoid perpetuating Sewanee's deep freeze. And we, we make Sewanee stronger here by provoking all this <coughs> dynamic potential. Do not wait for this institution to change on its own because I promise it won't. It will never change. <coughs> You have to be its eyes and its mind. You have to be its teeth. You have to be its arms and hands. You have to be its feet. That's all I have to say.